الحمد لله رب العالمين ونصلي ونسلم على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد Before beginning insha'Allah ta'ala I would like to make some recommended readings to those of you who are Muslims and non-Muslims. And I didn't bring the actual books, but I made photocopies of the covers of some of those books that can be found at Amazon and Borders and Barnes and Nobles. Inshallah ta'ala, they are recommended readings for the Muslim and the non-Muslim. Especially the person who calls to the way of our rightly guided predecessors. Because unfortunately, those who ascribe to that noble way, we have become cycloptic in some ways. And we need to broaden our scope with regards to what we read and what we learn so that we can follow the path of the likes of Shaykh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah who read the books of all of the people of desires and deviations that lived in his time. He read all of them. The Greeks and the Romans and the Persians, the Zoroastrians, all of those deviant people from the Mu'tazila and the Ash'ariya and the Jahmiya and the Murji'a and the Sufiya. And then he went out and he debated them and he refuted them. You won't be able to do anything unless you know what the other side is saying. Because sometimes the other side is saying similar to what you're saying. Sometimes exactly what you're saying. Sometimes exactly what you're saying. But unfortunately, as we mentioned, we have idolized ourselves. We placed ourselves on an island. So with that, inshallah, we're going to give an introduction from some non-Muslims. And this is taken from a khutbah that was done by myself last year in the state of Maryland. And it's taken from an article that was in the Baltimore Sun called Religious But Ignorant. Religious but ignorant. The talk is about Easter, and inshallah we'll tie it in. According to Professor Stephen, or some say Stephen, Prothero, chairman of the religion department at Boston University, he said, quote, with roughly nine in ten of its citizens claiming to believe in God or supreme being, America is widely acknowledged to be the most religious of modern industrial nations in the developed world if religiosity is measured by belief in all things supernatural from God and the virgin birth to the humbler workings of angels and demons. He goes on, he says, yet when it comes to knowledge about religion, it ranks, it meaning America, it ranks among the most ill-informed, while close to two-thirds of Americans regard the Bible as a source of answers to life's questions, only half can name even one of the New Testament Gospels. This is based on a survey that Professor Prothero at the Religion Department, who's the chairman, as we mentioned, of the Religion Department at Boston University, he conducted over 10 years, over a period of 10 years. He also, for instance, when he asked people of all different colors and ethnicities who claimed and ascribed to Christianity 
Not only did he ask them to name one of the four Gospels, he asked them to give the person who made quotes that he cited to them. Who said this? Who said that? For instance, he asked a question, who was the one that said, let there be light? He said, more than 60% of the Christians answered Thomas Edison. Now, the Muslims who are listening to my voice right now, they're laughing. At least those who are familiar with the Bible, they're laughing. Because they know that let there be light is from the Bible. Once again, it just goes to show how the Christians have become. They become people who are religious, but they are ignorant. And the Muslims are the same way. We become religious people concerned with spirituality, with religiosity, with getting close to Allah, but it's getting close to Allah in the Malcolm X way, by any means necessary. And that's not Islam. Professor Prothero, he goes on, because he was made a statement, you say the United States became a nation of forgetters, and at the same time, it became a nation of evangelicals. Professor Prothero, he said, evangelicalism, listen closely, brothers and sisters, and you non-Muslims. Evangelicalism, Professor Prothero says, became the dominant religious impulse in the early 19th century, replacing Puritanism. We'll stop right there. Remember the talk is about Easter and the origin of that Western or now adopted Western celebration. It's all connected, brothers and sisters. It's all tied together. If you know anything about Puritanism, then you'll understand what the professor is saying. If you know anything about evangelicalism, then you'll know what Professor Prothero is stating. He says, Puritans understand God through a combination of the head and the heart. The Puritan Christians, they understood God between the head and the heart. They were keen on religious learning and reason, but evangelicals were suspicious of the mind, focusing on experience and emotion, and they slowly turned Americans away from religious learning. <clears throat> Which brings me to the first book, Christian America, What Evangelicals Really Want by Christian Smith. Christian America, brothers and sisters in Islam, there is a movement in this country with political clout and used to be evangelical undertones that now has taken the forefront. Our president, President George W. Bush, if you go back in history, we're talking about Easter, brothers. Don't think we're getting away from the subject. Once again, it all ties in. Our president is one of the few presidents from the history of these presidents in this great country. And it is great. No doubt about it whatsoever. That used religious terms, that used religious terminologies in his speeches. Like some of the presidents not too far ago, or not too long ago, 
kept using religious terms. To Christians, some of those terms mean one thing, and to Muslims, those terms mean another thing. One example, crusade. Crusade to the Christians means one thing. It means conquering Muslims. And to the Muslims, crusade means being conquered. That's one word we'll leave to the side. The next thing we wanted to mention is from this book, 1001 Things You Always Wanted to Know About the Bible But Never Thought to Ask by J. Stephen Lang. This book right here. Listen to what he says on page 308. The celebration of the resurrection of Jesus occurs every Sunday, which Christians came to call, Christians came to call. Why are they saying came to call? Is because it doesn't necessarily mean that it's found in their book. Because one of the big differences, and there are many, many differences between the Muslim and the Christian, is that the Muslim has revelation in his hand that he reads daily that is the that is the foundation for every single thing he believes in and you can find what he says in his book that is if it's used properly because terrorism won't be found in, in the Quran that won't be found in the Quran and Sufism won't be found in the Quran. So they have to change the words around and call it Jihad, terrorism, and Ihsan, Sufism. But for the person who's mainstream and sticks to the Book of Allah and the authentic Sunnah of Allah, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we stick to the terms that our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used that he got from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala who is over his throne in a manner befitting his majesty. So we don't change the words because we know from our principles in Islam from the ulama of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah تَغْيِيرُ asma la يُغَيِّرُ الْحَقَائِقِ Changing the names of things doesn't change their reality. Changing the names of things doesn't change their reality. So he says, the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus occurs every Sunday, which Christians came to call the Lord's Day. And it was about a century before anyone began observing the annual event that came to be called Easter. It was first called Pascha, the Greek word for Passover, which was natural since Jesus' death. And I'm saying it between quotes because we don't believe that Jesus died. We don't believe that. They didn't kill him, nor did they crucify him. Well, I can They didn't kill him. وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ This is what the Lord of the world says. They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but it was made to appear as such. He goes on, he says, So this Greek word for Passover, which was natural since Jesus' death and resurrection, occurred near the Jewish Feast of Passover. The Apostle Paul referred to Jesus as, in quotes, our Passover Lamb. The first book of Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 7. Jesus called the Lamb of God several times in the New Testament was regarded as the perfect 
and final sacrifice for man's sins. In the year 325, the Council of Nasia or Nasia decreed that Easter 325 decreed that Easter would be celebrated each year on the Sunday following the first full moon after the spring equinox, which is March 21st. Easter was, until the last century or so, considered a much more important, a much more important holy day. We've already told you what the definition of holy day is or holiday in the talk on Valentine's Day. Easter was until the last century or so considered a much more important holy day than Christmas. And then he ends this section in this book of these 1,001 things that you never asked about the Bible that you should, you should know. He says the word Easter is not actually found in the Bible. And there are many things like this, brothers and sisters, and dear, most, dear non-Muslims. There are many things like this, foundational things that you don't have in your book. Terms, like Christmas. Christian, where's the word? In their book, in your book. We're still talking about Easter. In another book, <clears throat> in another book called Misquoting Jesus, Misquoting Jesus, in this book, and this is what it says in the inset. In the cover of the book, when world-class biblical scholar Bert, Bart Ehrman, Bart Ehrman began to study the text of the Bible in their original languages, he was startled to discover the multitude of mistakes and intentional alterations that had been made by earlier translators. In misquoting Jesus, Ehrman tells the story behind the mistakes and changes that ancient scribes made to the New Testament and shows the great impact they had upon the Bible that we use today. He frames his account with personal reflections on how his study of the Greek manuscripts made him abandon made him abandon he's a world class biblical scholar in fact this man Bart Ehrman is considered the leading scholar and most knowledgeable person in the United States of America on the New Testament the life of Jesus and the church We'll read it again. He frames his account with personal reflections on how his study of the Greek manuscripts made him abandon his once ultra-conservative views of the Bible. He was a hardcore Celebi Christian. <laughs> ultra right-wing Sunni Christian. It goes on, it says, since the advent of the printing press and the accurate reproduction of text, most people have assumed that when they read the New Testament, they are reading an exact copy of Jesus' words or St. Paul's writings. 
And yet, for almost 1,500 years, these manuscripts were hand-copied, were hand-copied by scribes who were deeply influenced by the cultural, theological, and political disputes of their day. Both mistakes and intentional changes, mistakes and intentional changes abound in the surviving manuscripts, making the original words, meaning of the Bible, specifically the New Testament, difficult to reconstruct. Allah Akbar. This is a Christian theologian. He says, for the first time, Ehrman reveals where and why these changes were made and how scholars go about reconstructing the original words of the New Testament as closely as possible. He goes on, he says, Ehrman makes the provocative case that many of our cherished biblical stories and widely held beliefs concerning the divinity of Jesus, the Trinity, and the divine origins of the Bible itself stem from both intentional and accidental alterations by scribes, alterations that dramatically affected all subsequent versions of the Bible. That's found in his book, Misquoting Jesus, where he shows over two-thirds of what they say Jesus said, he actually never said. So another person came behind Bart Ehrman and wrote a book called Misquotes in Misquoting Jesus. Why you can still believe, meaning believe in the mistakes, believe in the alterations, believe in the interpolations, believe in the personifications, believe in all the admixtures, believe in the stuff they put in, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his book, Yuharrifuna, that they change the meanings and the words and they say it's in Allah, that it's from Allah. They put these things in their book themselves and they say that it's in, that's from Allah. Yuharrifuna, they change the meanings. Listen to what this person, Dylan Barrows, in his flimsy, weaker than a spider web, a spider web attempt, trying to refute this scholar, one of the kibar al ulama of Christendom today. Listen to what he says when trying to refute Bart Ehrman, this scholar of the New Testament. When he talks about 1 John chapter 5, verse, verses 7 and 8, which is one of the key verses that they use for the Trinity and the Trinitarian formula. He says, I hold it so you can see. First, it must be noted that modern translations do not include this passage. 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. One of the number one verses they use to prove the Trinitarian doctrine. And there are three that bear witness or record in heaven. And those three are one. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They go on and they say, First, it must be noted, he's agreed that 
modern translations do not include this passage, acknowledging for centuries the inaccuracy of its usage. When I asked my mother, Ma, why do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? She said, because my father believed it. Exactly what Allah says in his book. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ قَالُوا بَلْ نَتَّبِعُوا مَا أَلْفَيْنَ عَلَيْهِ آبَاءٌ آبَاءُنَا And when it said to them, follow that which was revealed to you from your Lord, they say, no, we follow that which our forefathers followed. Allah says, even though they didn't have any sense, even though they didn't have any sense, you still follow them? He's admitting that this is inaccurate. He says, for, the, for this reason alone, it is curious why misquoting Jesus even invests such time on these verses. You see what he's saying? In other words, Bart Ehrman is being accused of citing the fact that the book that the Christians say is untainted, unsullied, perfectly the word of God, 100% from Genesis to Revelation, depending on the book that you use, a disparity of six or seven books from the Catholic version of the Bible and the Protestant version, 66 and one, the latter that is, and the former, what? 70 what? 72. So, he's, quote, he's quoting Bart Ehrman, saying, yes, I agree with you. So why are you mentioning it? When mentioning it is because he's actually telling the Christians there has to be a tasfiyah and a tarbiyah. He's telling the Christians there has to be a purification of the scripture. And it has to be another form of educating and cultivating and rearing the Christians. He goes on trying to refute him. He says, the motivation may be to further strengthen Ehrman's argument for a Bible changed through political force. In this instance, in this instance, he's correct. He rightly notes that the verse did not even enter the Bible until 1522. And for those of us who study this, for those of us who study this in more detail, we know that that verse, 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 through 8, that they use as a proof for the Trinitarian doctrine, was a marginal note by a man named Vigilus from the city of Capsus. He wrote it on the side of the manuscript of the Bible nothing to do with it, and some people came behind him and inserted it into the Bible. Can you imagine that, brothers and sisters? It's like the satanic verses with the Quran. Praise be to Allah, who perfects all acts of righteousness. We have millions of chufav, millions of people who have memorized the Quran. You can't slip a verse in the Quran. You can't say that came from Allah. This is this is what, this is what Allah said. That's what Allah said. Because we got a six-year-old boy, a nine-year-old girl in Turkey or Pakistan or South Africa who will quote what Allah says word for word. That's a nigma from Allah. As for those other people, they don't know if Matthew said it, John said it, Paul said it, Luke said it. They don't know if Bush said it, Cheney said it. They don't know if Condoleezza Rice said it. It doesn't make a difference. They don't know. And that's why we invite you Christians to Islam. And we invite you Jews to Islam. And leave off these made up, bogus, counterfeit, innovated, heretical celebrations like Easter. He goes on, he says, while the verses history definitely fuels Ehrman's viewpoint, it simply highlights a historical problem translators 
have long corrected Allah. to suggest listen to how he tries to come with a, some, some, some weight now to suggest that this error disproves the trinity or the original manuscripts in errancy in errancy is a logical fallacy does one does one historical flaw mean the entire new testament is flawed but you are the guys that are saying that the whole book is from God. How can you make that statement? We'll read it again for those of you who don't understand what he just said. Does one historical flaw, see how he tries to paint it over? Historical flaw, he shouldn't have said historical flaw. This is something that was inserted into the book that you're saying is from God. You can't call that a historical flaw. That's not a historical flaw. Does one historical flaw mean the entire New Testament is flawed? It would be the equivalent of saying that because my toe is broken, that my entire body is useless. Brothers and sisters in Islam, and dear listeners, the Christians and the other non-Muslims who practice and follow and worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and celebrate on that which they call Good Friday and on the Sunday that follows it, Easter. That which they have fallen into is a heresy and it's rooted in paganism. And that paganism, according to the Christians themselves, they say, quote, Easter, the highlight of the religious calendar for most Christian churches is now upon us again. For the Jewish community, this is also the Passover season. Most of us have prob probably noticed that Easter and Passover fall during the same time of year, often within a few days of each other. It may come as a surprise to know, this Christian writer says, that Easter is an outgrowth of the Passover, especially since these days are celebrated so differently. They go on, because there's a lot here from the Christians, approximately 29 pages. They say the biblical name Passover was changed to Easter, the name of the Teutonic goddess of spring. The Teutonic goddess of spring. The Passover lamb was replaced with Easter ham. The Passover lamb, L-A-M-B as in boy, was replaced with the Easter ham. Ham meaning oink oink. That this Christian says, biblically, is forbidden. It's forbidden. Ham is forbidden and not to be eaten. They go on. They say, and if this celebration is so important, why didn't Jesus teach his apostles and the early church to observe it? It's a good question from a Christian. The books of the New Testament were written over a span of decades after Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. Yet nowhere do we see so much as a hint of any kind of Easter celebration. So you ask your grandmother, why do you celebrate Easter? 
Why do you celebrate the birth of a Teutonic God? She's going to say to you, because that's what my father followed, and that's what my mother worshiped, and that's what my grandmother celebrated, because they're religious but ignorant. They're religious but have no ilm. And we know for the Muslims what we learn from Imam al Dawa, Al Mujaddid, Shaykh al Islam, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, Al Tamimi, Rahmatullahi alayhi. We learn from him what he learned from the people who follow Ibn Taymiyyah, from the people who follow Imam Ahmed, Imam Ahl al Sunnah in his time. From what he learned from those who came before him back to the Sahaba and the Messenger of Allah himself, Salawatullahi wa sallam wa alayhi, that Imam al Bukhari has in his book, his Sahih, Al Ilmu Qabal al Qawl wal Amal. Knowledge precedes statements and actions. We're not like the Christians, or we shouldn't be like the Christians. That we just quote and quote and quote and follow and follow and implement and implement. Ask your grandmother, why do you celebrate Easter? And she'll say to you, son, my mother taught me about Easter. And Easter is something that we believe in firmly. Because the Bible tells us that we have to celebrate Easter. If you said to your grandmother holding her dear hand, begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide her to Islam and Tawheed and the leave of shirk, but grandma or Grammy or Nana or whatever you want to call her, there's no mention of Easter in the Bible. This is paganism. This is heathenism, grandma. Boy, I'm happy that you ain't selling drugs no more and you became a Muslim. I'm happy that you ain't robbing banks no more and you became a Muslim. Whatever's good for you, I like that religion because it, it straightened you up, it cleaned you up. But you got your way and I got mine. And the Lord said we have to, we have to celebrate Easter because Jesus died for our sins. He was put in the sepulchre. And he rose on the third day, which the sign of Jonah we still waiting for. The sign of Jonah we're still waiting for. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, at Easter, popular customs reflect many ancient pagan survivals. The Encyclopedia Encyclopedia Britannica. It says, in this instance, it's connected with spring fertility rites, such as the symbols of the Easter egg and the Easter hare or rabbit. This is the 15th edition, Macropedia, volume 4, page 605, under the section Church Year. Alexander Hislop's work called The Two Babylons is still considered a definitive work on pagan, on pagan customs that survive in today's religious practices. On Easter, he wrote, quote, what means the term Easter itself? It is not a Christian name. It bears its Chaldean origin on its very forehead. Easter is nothing else than Astat, one of the titles of Beltis, the Queen of Heaven, whose name, as pronounced by the people of Nineveh, was evidently identical with that now in common use in this country. That name, as found by early archaeologist Sir Austin Henry Leyland on the Assyrian monuments, is Ishtar. 
Ishtar. The name Easter then comes not from the Bible. Instead, its roots go far back to the ancient pre-Christian Mesopotamian goddess Ishtar. In the Bible, Ashtoreth. Brothers and sisters in Islam, this particular practice of Easter is something that has to be abandoned. It has to be abandoned, and the only way that it can be abandoned is that we explain to the Christians the nature, the true nature of God. To attack the issue of Easter itself, meeting it head on, it won't work. Because the crux and the foundation of all these pagan celebrations is the fact that the people don't know who God is. They don't know the nature of God. For if they did, they would not ascribe to him a son. If they truly understood who and what God is, they would not ascribe to him a son. And the issue of dying on the cross, being resurrected, and all of these other issues wouldn't be an issue. It would not be an issue. And with that, inshallah, We'd like to leave you with another statement, our final statement, inshallah. This is from the retired Episcopal Bishop, right here in Newark, New Jersey, a retired bishop for more than 40 years, John Shelby Spong, in his book entitled, Why? Christianity must change or die. Why Christianity must change or die. His name is John, former Episcopal Baptist, excuse me, Episcopal Bishop. Right here in New, New Jersey. John Shelby Spawn. The name of the book is why Christianity must change or die. Quote, in conclusion, the way we approach the Christ figure has got to be radically revised. Jesus can no longer be the incarnation of the theistic deity. The way we Christians approach the Christ figure has got to be radically revised. Meaning, we need to go back and look at how the Muslims understand Jesus. We need to go and look at the Quran and see if what we have in our book coincides with the Quran. That's not really what he's saying because he's not going to direct you to the Quran. He just knows as an as an Episcopal bishop, being able to read the manuscripts in its original context, he knows that what they're saying about Jesus is not true. That's why he says, Jesus can no longer be the incarnation of the theistic deity. End of quote. May Allah guide you non-Muslims, you Christians, you Jews, you Buddhists, you Hindus, to the oneness and the uniqueness in his oneness of Allah, the Supreme Being. And may you Muslims marry to your religiosity, knowledge, so that you don't follow the Christians and the Jews being religious but ignorant. Hala wa sallallahu wa sallam وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وسلم سبحانك اللهم وحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك 
wa atubu ilaykum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh